It's a great honor for me to be here at the Empire Club of Canada today, which is arguably the most famous and historically relevant speakers podium to have ever existed in Canada. It has offered its podium to such international luminaries as Winston Churchill, Ronald Reagan, Audrey Hepburn, the Dalai Lama, Indira Gandhi, and closer to home, from Pierre Trudeau to Justin Trudeau. Literally generations of our great nation's leaders, alongside with those of the world's top international diplomats, heads of state, and business and thought leaders. It is a real honor and a distinct privilege to be invited to speak to the Empire Club of Canada, which has been welcoming international diplomats, leaders in business and in science and in politics. And when they stand at that podium, they speak not only to the entire country, but they can speak to the entire world. Good afternoon, fellow directors, past presidents, members, and guests. Welcome to the 118th season of the Empire Club of Canada. My name is Kelly Jackson. I'm the president of the board of directors of the Empire Club of Canada and vice president external affairs and professional learning at Humber College. And I'm your host for today's event, the power of education in advancing reconciliation. I'd like to begin this afternoon with an acknowledgement that I'm hosting this event within the traditional and treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the homelands of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wyandotte peoples. In acknowledging traditional territories, I do so from a place of understanding the privilege my ancestors and I have had in this country since they first arrived here in the 1830s. As farmers in southwestern Ontario, I imagine they felt a deep connection to the land and yet likely did not recognize how that connection was built on the displacement of others. Delivering a land acknowledgement for me, it's always an important opportunity to reflect on our human connection and responsibility to care for the land and to recognize that to do so, we must always respect each other and acknowledge our histories. We encourage everyone tuning in today to learn more about the traditional territory on which you work and live. The Empire Club of Canada is a nonprofit organization. So I need to take a moment now because we need to recognize our sponsors. They generously support the club and they make these events possible and complimentary for our supporters to attend. Thank you to our lead event sponsors, BBC, the Business Development Bank of Canada and Hydro One. Thank you to today's supporting sponsors, Edelman and Newport Aviation. And thank you also to our seasoned sponsors, the Canadian Bankers Association, Leuna, Waste Connections of Canada, and Bruce Power. Before we get started today, just a few housekeeping notes. I want to remind everybody who's participating that this is an interactive event. Those attending live are encouraged to engage by taking advantage of the question box. Scroll down below your on-screen video player to find it. We've re reserved some time for audience questions at the end of the discussion. We also invite you to share your thoughts on social media using the hashtags displayed on screen throughout the event. If you require start a conversation with our team using the chat button on the right hand side of your screen. To those watching on demand later and to those tuning in on the podcast, welcome. It is now my pleasure to call this virtual meeting to order. I am honored to welcome our guests today, Dr. Tracy Baer. Chief Cadmus DeLorme, Chief Stacey LaForme, and Corey Wilson. They are joining us at the Empire Club of Canada's virtual stage. You'll hear more about them shortly, and you can find their full bios on the page below the video player on your screen. Before we hear from our guests, I'd like to invite Penny Favell, Vice President, Indigenous Relations at Hydro One, to deliver some opening remarks. Penny, welcome, and over to you. Thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Penny Fable, and I'm the Vice President of Indigenous Relations here at Hydro One. I'm so pleased to be invited to participate and listen in on this exciting discussion about the power of education to advance reconciliation in Canada. Over my first year here at Hydro One, I've had the honor of 
guiding the company on its journey through reconciliation. And I believe that reconciliation is more than just a commitment to the 94 calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Report. It's actually an ongoing process for industry, institutions, governments, and most importantly, all Canadians to undertake and to, to commit to. And education is such a vital tool and opportunity for all Canadians to learn from the past, to acknowledge present and historic wrongs, and to commit to improving Canada for all of us. Hydro One's footprint impacts over 100 Indigenous communities in Ontario, and I'm so pleased to see the commitment our employees at Hydro One have had to learning more about Indigenous communities, to learning more about the history of Canada, and importantly, the individual cultures, traditions, and language of the various Indigenous communities that Hydro One interacts with every single day. I'm also extremely delighted to be able to introduce Chief Stacy LaForme, elected chief of the Mississaugas of the Credit First of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Chief LaForme has been serving his community for over 20 years. First elected to council in 1999. He's committed to increasing involvement and communication with both on and off reserve members and elected council. He's very active throughout the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, which actually encompass 3.9 million acres of Southern Ontario land. He's committed not only as a chief, but as a noted storyteller, a published author and a poet. I personally had a few months ago the opportunity to hear Chief LaForme share one of his poems uh, on a radio interview. And of course, I immediately Googled him to find out more about his poems. And I was delighted to discover not only a Renaissance man, but someone who's been committed to lifelong learning. At Hydro One, we're very pleased to sponsor this event. And we're very proud of our partnership with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, who are our equity partners on the Niagara Reinforcement Project, which is a 76 kilometer transmission line in the heart of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation traditional territory. I'm now turning it over to Chief LaForme. Thank you so much. Uh, Miigwech, Penny. So I appreciate that um, wonderful introduction. I usually cut people off when I'm in person after they just get to my name, Chief Stacy LaForme, and I interrupt and say, that's good enough, but, uh, but I appreciate it. Um, first things first, um, I usually go by Gima or Ogama, I do answer to chief, uh, but that's only out of respect for the audience. Um, so, because Ogama and Gima are more of our keeping than chief, that's a construct not of our making. Anyway, um, I would like to welcome everybody here to this panel discussion on, um, you know, the power of education and advancing reconciliation. Uh, we have a wonderful panel here before you, a highly intelligent people, well, well respected in their fields. And I'll, I'll introduce them shortly, but first I'd like to say I, I was asked to be the moderator. Now, moderator is just a fancy term for, you know, if our guests start going on and on, I get to use the hook and yank them out of the, out of the speaking role. So uh, that's my job. Um, you know, there's, there's um, one thing that I've often said, and that is that certain institutions by their very nature have an obligation to tell the truth. So truthful that it hurts. And education is one of those fields. Um, I want to start off the uh, panel discussion by reciting a poem that I um, wrote the day after the uncovering of the 215 children at the residential school sites. Um, of course, you know it's well over 2,000 children now, but it's called Reconciliation slash 215. I sit here crying. I don't know why. I didn't know the children. I didn't know the parents. But I knew their spirit. I knew their love. I know their loss. I know their potential. And I am overwhelmed by the pain and the hurt. The pain of the families and friends 
the pain of an entire people, unable to protect them, to help them, to comfort them, to love them. I did not know them, but the pain is so real, so personal. I feel it in my core, my heart, my spirit. I sit here crying and I am not ashamed. I will cry for them and the many others like them. I will cry for you. I will cry for me. I'll cry for what could have been. Then I'll calm myself, smudge myself, offer prayers, and know they are no longer in pain. No longer do they hurt. They are at peace. In time, I will tell their story. I will educate society so their memory is not lost. And when I am asked, what does reconciliation mean to me? I will say, I want their lives back. I want them to live, to soar. I want to hear their laughter, see their smiles. Give me that and I'll grant you reconciliation. So I, I, I wrote that poem in a moment of love, anger, pain, and understanding. And um, I think that, you know, when we've talked about reconciliation in the past, we've just brushed on the surface. And now we're all aware of just how much work that is in front of us and how much we have to do together to get there. So, so Miigwech, now, now I'd like to um, go on to um, introduce the panel. Uh, you know, we have um, Chief Cadmus Delorme, Kawasis First Nation, uh, Corey Wilson, Executive Director, Indigenous Institution, Initiatives and Partnerships, British Columbia Institute of Technology, and Dr. Tracy Baer, Director of McMaster Indigenous Research Institute, Assistant Professor, Dep Department of Sociology, Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences, McMaster University. Um, will, we are, we are uh, making room so that each um, panelist has five minutes to do an opening. And um, Dr. Bear, if you would please begin. Hi, hi, Miigwech. Thank you for that introduction and thank you for beginning us um, off in that, um, with that beautiful poem. Um, so, Tanse uh, Tracy Bear, Nitsigasam, Montreal Lake Cree Nation, Otsinia, which is Treaty 6 territory. Um, coming to you now from uh, um, a different territory, an unceded land. Uh, this is a um, land that is governed by Dish with One Spoon, uh, a land of Haudenosaunee, uh, Mississauga of a uh, Credit, and also Six Nations. And so I'm a, a guest on this land and very honored to be here with my esteemed colleagues. I want to begin today um, by bringing a little bit of um, myself to you and my culture. Um, I'm Cree and I was brought up um, in many ways, uh, traditional ways, but also very contemporary realities. And so one of the things that my uh, family kept is um, smudging. Uh, and we it was mentioned earlier before, and smudging in my teachings um, begins everyone off in a good way. Uh, we smudge uh, with medicines, and for Cree people, the four sacred medicines are tobacco, sweet grass, um, and sage, and we also have red willow. So I have some sage here that I picked in Batosh, and I'd like to start off um, with the uh, online virtual smudge uh, for everyone um, so that we start this conversation in a good way, that we listen with uh, good um, intentions, that we speak with good intentions, and then we see and feel things in a good way. So. Smudge bowl, sage, and matches. So this is a little smudge bowl that I have that I was given. And here's the little bowl of sage that I have picked from Batosh in 2019 with my sisters. And so, uh, you know how we shower off um, at the end of the day or the beginning of the day and you wash off all that dirt and grit? A smudge is like a spiritual cleanse. So you're smudging yourself as well, not only to, you know, start off in a good day, but to also um, cleanse yourself of anything that might be sticking to you. So 
So you light the medicine with a match. These are my teachings. And you can see here the smoke. And I don't know, for those of you that smudge a lot, sometimes this kind of um, uh, olfactory memory, so you can smell it. Um, I know when people do virtual smudges with me, I can almost smell the sage. So. And here's to you, my good listeners and good folks out there. Um, a smudge for you and a prayer up for you that we come together in a good way and have a great conversation. Hi, hi. And now I'd like to turn it over to my esteemed colleague, uh, Corey Wilson. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for that smudge. That, of course, is not my tradition. Um, but one of the points I wanted to make is that there's incredible diversity amongst us as Indigenous people. And I always appreciate the teachings from uh, my brothers and sisters from across the country. So Gila Kasala, thank you for that. I'm Corey Wilson, and I'm coming to you today from Musqueam Territory, which is the territory of UBC, for those of you that know Vancouver. But I'm Kwakwakiwak uh, from northern Vancouver Island. And I've been a guest on Musqueam Territory for almost maybe 25 years or so. So I'm very grateful to uh, the Coast Salish people that have allowed me to live, work and play on their territory. Um, I come from the Northwest coast of, of British Columbia where we potlatch. Um, I think it's, it's way too wet out here to grow uh, smudge, uh, a sage and the, the various items that you have. But of course we have our own ceremonies. And, and when I'm thinking about the power of education, I think about my cultural system, which is the potlatch, which is a system that is, you know, it's a, everything for us. It's our system of governance, our system of justice, our system of education. And when I think about how we're taught as um, young people in our system to learn our roles and our, our responsibilities, it's really by watching and observing it with gentle and kindness, and uh, but somewhat very pointed. And, and as, as uh, we spoke about this earlier, one of the stories that comes to my mind is around, of course, we're taught about the respect for nature. And I remember one time with my granny in her kitchen, uh, there was a huge spike Spider, and it kind of freaked me out a little bit. I was young. I was maybe seven, eight years old. And the spider, of course, I assumed was coming to attack me. Um, so I stepped on it. And I don't know how my, I still to this day, I have no idea how my granny knew uh, because she was washing dishes and she, she just goes, hmm. And she didn't, I didn't see her turn around and she goes, hmm, I wonder who will feed that spider's babies tonight. So, of course, I just fell flat on the floor and just felt horrible. And now I had these pictures of all these spiders that aren't going to have food. And But you see in that the lessons and the teachings that happen um, for Indigenous people where they're told through stories and told through um, ways that show the connection between and amongst, uh, you know, not only humans, but animals and the environment and that type of stuff. And, and it also reminds me of how knowledge is power, um, absolute um, knowledge is the most powerful weapon. You've heard all of the quotes from various uh, incredible people around the world. And that education itself is also a formal, very much more, much of a formal process, the K to 12 system, the post-secondary system, but it's also a very informal system as well. And it's something that we have to remember that knowledge is gained from all areas and all aspects of our life. And it is also an ongoing process that we have to, um, in, uh, ensure that we actively participate in. And, and just to uh, make a few more points uh, as well as uh, one of the things that I really love and would love for you to take away is to recognize that indigenization or reconciliation in post-secondary institutions or K-12 to is not simply about just adding indigenous content to the curriculum or hiring an indigenous person. It is about how do we make true and systemic lasting change in these institutions that of course came from Eurocentric views and values and recognize that truth and reconciliation is is not only the work of governments and communities but it is the work of all of us as people as uh, citizens of Canada as as uh, members in various communities that we occupy it's a very deep deeply personal um, role that we all must play and we must play that with intention we must also have the courage I know people talk about safe spaces and of course I respect everybody's need to feel safe and secure 
but ch that's not how we make systemic change. We have to have bold and courageous conversations in every room in this country, whether that's the boardroom, whether it's the Empire Club, whether it's uh, while you're sitting watching your child at hockey practice, we have to have bold and courageous conversations and we must talk about the elephants in the room and talk about the ways that we can make the systemic change. And one of the actions um, is that every single one of us has to examine our own unconscious bias and bias and our own privilege. Deep self-reflection is required to advance truth and reconciliation and then lead to intentional actions that will make this difference for all of us. And so I really encourage um, every single one of us to recognize our role in reconciliation and recognize that it, it much of the work has to be done internally and then in the places and spaces that we occupy and it has to be grounded in truth. So. Those are my opening comments and I'll pass it on to the incredible Chief Cadmus Delar. Nanaskamun, thank you, uh, Corey. Uh, good afternoon to the Empire Club. Thank you, uh, Chief uh, Laforme for the introductions and uh, thank you, Dr. Bear for the smudge in the prayer and then good morning or afternoon to my friend Corey as well. I come to you from Cowes' First Nation in Southeast Saskatchewan, uh, Treaty 4 territory. I um, have uh, been a chief for seven years now uh, for my First Nation. I, I look young. That's that reserve water. I get to shower in every day. Why, why I look so young. I um, wanted to just mention that when we acknowledge land in this country, and, and it's, it's a great thing to acknowledge the territory we share together, one of the things I, I like to ask as well uh, as a fellow a proud Canadian, but also an Indigenous person, is to acknowledge something you're doing in your backyard with Indigenous people. When you acknowledge land, it's very respectable, but follow it up with something you're actually tangibly doing with truth and reconciliation calls to action. And if there's nothing, then it motivates you to, to reassess um, what you're doing. I wanted to mention that in order to really truly get to truth and reconciliation, we have to first accept and understand the truth. You cannot move to reconciliation until you first accept and acknowledge the truth. One of the things that is really important is we truly inherited such a unique history in this country. Ca Canada is a developed country, a G7 country. On the human index, we're sixth or seventh in the world to, to live. Within Canada, though, we have our challenges when it comes to the relationship between Indigenous people and Canada. There is no Indigenous person in this country that doesn't want to be a part of the growth and the development. The thing that we inherited is the intergenerational trauma and the, the lack of participation this country has provided to Indigenous people. And, and that is something of the truth that we must all dig in, in deeper in your territory. There are over 630 First Nations in this country. It is not a cookie cutter solution. Every nation has its culture, its language, its, its colonization challenges, its decolonization plan. And we cannot do it alone. We are looking for um, support. We're looking for people to stand with us as we heal at our pace. I just want to mention when it comes to education, I grew up on my First Nation. I am not a residential school survivor. I was raised by residential school survivors. There was a residential school in my community, what I'm a spokesperson today of. But one of the things is just because I'm Indigenous doesn't necessarily mean that I know all the truths that happened to my people. My parents never really talked about residential school because they didn't want to, to, to really put that, that, if I can say it more openly, that biased and negative opinion they had living and to make sure that I was, you know, a, a pure mind, if I can say it like that, they protected me. So we got to understand when we're working with Indigenous people that we just can't assume in this country that we all know our history and the, the truth and the pain. We're still figuring it out ourselves. And if 
It was the unmarked graves that triggered a lot of Indigenous people in this country. In, in closing, I, I obtained a master's degree at one of the most non-Indigenous public policy schools in the Saskatchewan, and I loved it because I grew up Indigenous. I went to First Nations University of Canada and got my undergrad in business administration. So I, I know what it is to be Indigenous and the education. But to understand the other side of the coin through the public policy school I went to at Johnson Shiama, it allowed me to know that there is truly two worldviews in this country, and they're both beautiful, and we must not be afraid to know that there are two, and we must accept it. So thank you very much for my uh, letting me do my opening comments. Well, thank you very much to our, our panelists uh, for that. I'll, I'll stick into the, the time limits. That's very, very kind of you. I know that the, the moderator went over his time. <clears throat> So um, thank you for that. I'd like to start off by offering, asking some questions. Um, the first one is, um, what is the fundamental role of education in advancing reconciliation? And I'll start with you, Dr. Tracy Bear. Hi, hi. Um, so I, I think educating oneself is really only half the work. Um, it's a lifelong process, and uh, even from some of my um, oldest teachers, my knowledge keepers, and my elders, you know, they'll be sitting there at uh, 98 years old saying, "My girl, I don't know anything." And so they come with a lot of humility, and they understand that this is a lifelong process. So why shouldn't it be for anyone else? Then this lifelong process is rooted in action. Um, it requires a lot of humility and ongoing critical and self-reflection, like uh, Corey had mentioned earlier. Being an educated ally, you know, is it's not a badge of honor. It's um, it's a sign of privilege. And I think to do this, it's really crucial to establish a direct line of communication. Um, and that could be through a friend or directly involved, someone that's been impacted by these struggles or like a volunteer position, an action item um, with a community organization, individuals that you know, or communities. And I'm thinking about the process through education. People are like, let's get educated, but what happens with along that education. And I can tell you, um, one of my uh, uh, Indigenous <clears throat> friends um, wrote something called Indigenous Allies. And uh, he talks about these four things. And uh, one is with this education comes the hiring of Indigenous peoples, people that were need to be involved in the creation and ownership of initiatives that are made about them and for them. Um, Another thing is properly remunerating and crediting Indigenous people for their knowledge, for their time. When you ask someone to come and speak for you and with you um, to your communities, remember that these knowledge keepers are often asked to do this a lot and you're taking time away from their communities and their families. So that proper respect and honoring of their time is really important. Passing the mic, that's number three, um, to Indigenous people at events, as we are doing here today, in the arts, in music, in film, um, in theater, and making decisions uh, that affect them. And finally, that recognizing that Indigenous peoples have ownership, they have control, they have access and possession of their information, uh, their knowledge, experiences and stories. These are all things that need to happen along with education. Um, so um, final thoughts on that is that uh, it is an ongoing um, uh, self-reflection, a critical self-reflection and positioning yourself, knowing where you come from, whose land you're on and acknowledging that in all the respectful ways. So I think I'm passing it on to Corey now. Thank you. Hi, hi. Well, yeah, that, thank, thank you for that answer, uh, Dr. Um, Corey, did you have a, another comment you'd like to make on that subject? 
I'm okay. I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess the thing I would just say is that it's about truth as well. It's really about having the courage to go forward and to ensure that everything, as Cadmus said and as Dr. Bear said, it has to be grounded on truth. We know this information. We knew there were bodies buried at residential schools. As soon as the regis first residential schools started, I'm sure there was a body buried there within six months. It was articulated in the in the um, the, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People in 1996. We've consistently told our story and our truths. So education and advancing reconciliation is not just about um, learning the truth, but it's about actually listening to the or acknowledging the truths that have been told since the beginning of contact or the beginning of time as well. So and uh, believing those truths and knowing that they are true, I mean, I've said truth, truth a million times here, but it's, it's about actually believing what we tell you and believing what we say. There's no point in the same with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls Commission. We have said what our people need, what we need to uh, make the lives of Indigenous people better. And if we do that, if my children succeed, your children will succeed. Canada will succeed. Our provinces and territories will succeed if we work together, because there's no question that together we're strong but we have to listen and acknowledge the truths that are there and have been there since contact. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Corey. Um, so, um, Chief Cadmus, I have a, a question for you that um, sort of follow up on that. We've been talking a lot about the truth and um, how important that is in the education system. You know, understanding the historical contents, the injustices that are occurring, how do we be accurate and truthful when so often that truth can be overwhelming, not only to our younger learners, but also to our older learners as well? Thank you, Chief Laform. It's interesting to just assess the education system that, that we have had since 18, uh, I'll use generations. We gotta understand what education has done to us as a country in the bias when it comes to Indigenous people. And I'm going to make this about Indigenous because I'm Indigenous, so I'm coming out biased just because I see the worldview very Indigenous, which is, you know, a good thing in this country. I just want to make sure it's a positive view, is the baby boomer generation. What did the baby boomer generation truly learn about Indigenous people in the education this country sponsored? My, my people the baby boomer learned from Hollywood movies, the, the breech cloth, the paint on the face, the living in teepees and the peak of residential school was going on at the time. Uh, the, the very negative things, the generation X, the white paper was taught in education systems that that was the solution. The 1969 white paper to just abolish rights, reserves, land claims, who you are as indigenous, just be Canadian. Um, well, why do you want special privilege? That's a generation that learned that the white paper was actually a, a, a solution. If anybody thinks that, reset your mind right now because you're wasting your energy. The generation Y, a little better, but treaties were about surrender was about living on reserves. Today, our millennial and generation Z, they're learning the spirit and intent. They're learning about the truth of residential schools, but there's no mandatory 100 class coming to those other generations across this country. It's up to us as proud Canadians to realize that we were biased our entire life when it comes to education on the truth. So. Um, number 57 is a prime example, professional development on the truth in organizations. And so, um, you know, I, I would leave my answer there is uh, we got our own homework to do as Canadians to reset our minds so we don't just hand the issue off to our children and children yet unborn. Thank you, Chief. I pr appreciate that answer. Um, Dr. Um, Bear, did you have anything you want to answer to that, uh, add to that question? Uh, sure. Um, so I get asked this question a lot. I do presentations and uh, what else can I do? Do you have a list of resources for me that I can read? And uh, um, so often I ask, well, where have you looked so far and uh, why haven't you succeeded in finding anything? Um, in a world of Google, if someone wanted a 
I don't know, uh, French bulldog, they would Google and they would look for it and they would find it. I don't feel like there's any excuse anymore. Um, I think indigenous people have been incredibly patient in creating a mountain of resources and all different kinds of media. Um, I, you know, I led a team for three and a half years to create uh, the massive open online course called Indigenous Canada. And, you know, over 450,000 people have taken it. It's fantastic. It's a free resource. Um, and but even if you're not online, uh, you know, there's public libraries and there's books for all ages of children. Um, there's comics, there's graphic novels, performances music, dance, you name it, um, that all address these histories. Uh, and I think even social media is brimming with Indigenous peoples now telling their stories. There's TikTok and Snapchat, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and for some of us older folks, Facebook, you know, it's, uh, there's no excuse that you can't find uh, these truths and these stories anymore. So you know, I often um, compare <clears throat> my pedagogical approach is really kiss, kick, kiss. And, you know, these are hard truths that we need to learn. Um, and oftentimes our histories are come through, especially in educational institutions, through a deficit model. And what I mean by that is when we talk about uh, Indigenous people in education, we jump to residential schools. But what's really important, I think, is to ground ourselves and others in telling stories of how we passed on knowledge, what our education systems were like prior to colonization. That's the kiss. Talk about the residential schools, that's the kick. And then lastly, you follow up with all the amazing things Indigenous people and communities are doing for themselves. And that's the, that's the other kick or kiss. And these are hard truths. Um, but remember, you know, uh, and Corey said this uh, as well, you need to be uncomfortable because that's where the real learning happens. It's been uncomfortable for us for many, many years, and it's going to be awkward and you're going to squirm a little bit. But these are hard truths that need to be faced. Um, Indigenous people live in these contemporary realities based on the consequences of um, these histories. So it's really in absolutely integral that we all learn these together. I okay, thank, thank you, thank you. Uh, so I have a question for um, Corey Wilson now. It's, um, you know, in the education institutions, there's a big focus on the truth and rightly so, but how do um, education systems move to the reconciliation part of that story, truth and reconciliation? Um, and how do they get students to understand their role in that part of the story. Uh, sure. So just to pick up on what the previous uh, speakers have said, I mean, this is, first off, we have to accept all of the truths that are out there. We have to mm -hmm. accept that the solutions to the challenges that First Nations people, Indigenous people face in Canada are there in the recommendations from various reports and, and inquiries, just as Tracy, Dr. Tracy just mentioned as well, that all of the resources are there. I'm sure every single one person listening to us has an advanced degree of some sort or another. And you obviously know how to do research. So Google and find out what you need to find out. Have the courage, overcome the fear and do that. So in terms of post-secondary institutions, I mean, the reality is, is we're all at different places in, in um, where we're at in terms of advancing reconciliation. But the advancing reconciliation and truth at post-secondary institutions is not just for the benefit of the students. It must also lead to systemic change at the institutions because otherwise you're just going to keep perpetuating the, the, the barriers and the I issues that uh, have kept Indigenous people out of the academy and in many ways kept uh, you know tenured haven't given the number of tenured professors we should have. Um, so one thing I'm really proud of at BCIT, British Columbia's Institute of Technology, is we've created an Indigenous vision where we built a powerful framework and an example of what um, education and the academy can do. And also within it, it's not just about what we should and could do, but it's also holding ourselves accountable about what we can do. We recognize that uh, advancing reconciliation and truth at BCIT is a responsibility of all all schools and all departments. And I completely agree with Dr. Tracy Bear about creating open sourced resources. We have the same Indigenous awareness, open sourced resources, which means everybody can use it. 
But the reality is it's everybody's responsibility. So every every senior leader has to be responsible or has to, at the end of the year, articulate what they've done to advance reconciliation at BCIT. And remembering indigenization isn't just about adding content to the curriculum, but rethinking how we do. We've done a baseline study of what it, of what percentage of our courses have indigenous content. Now we have a measure that we a metric that we can change and, and work to and changing. Uh, but just to some summarize briefly, I mean, the biggest thing, whatever you do, it's nothing about us without us. We're all familiar with that same. So you shouldn't have any conversations about anything Indigenous without an Indigenous person involved in those conversations, not to take over, not to control, but simply to consult to ensure that you're going in the right direction, you're following protocols, and you're being respectful. The other thing is has to be authentically Indigenous-led. If you don't have a senior, who is your senior Indigenous person at your post-secondary institution? You need to, if you don't have one you need to have one and does that person whenever they need to or feel they should have access to the president and this it goes for companies and organizations as well does that senior indigenous person have the cell phone number of the president or the ceo if they don't what's the point because that is where we know change can happen from the bottom up but the reality is it happens a much many of the decisions are made at the board level made at the senior leadership table so the indigenous person must have access to that table and to those discussions indigenous initiatives and and uh, things that will help uh, help have to also be part of core budget they can't be program program funding or uh, you know year yearly funding that's you know the not renewable where you can't plan so it must be part of core budgets we need allies to do this work and the recognition of course that everybody has a role and i think one of the biggest challenges in the academy is recognizing of course schools and departments get their funding based on you know numbers and different things like that but the academy as a whole has to acknowledge that the indigenous initiatives and partnerships uh, department or whatever it's called in your institution or your section in your organization is really benefiting the entire organization so there has to be some credit given to that and to the demands on uh, people in those departments so you know whether that's recruiting new students helping helping create a partnership so you can apply for a shirk grant or whether that's uh, you know, helping you find a community, whatever that is, it's important that you recognize that there is a lot of um, a lot of pressure on the Indigenous departments and the people are there because they want to do the work, they believe in it, that department was created because the institution believes in it, but it has to be properly supported, it has to be properly um, uh, valued and then then it goes both ways where we can help and support the schools and the deans and the various other people to do the work that they want to do as well to enhance their program and curriculum, help them build partnerships, help them hire Indigenous people. So it's really about being intentional, authentically engaging, and recognizing the value that those Indigenous departments or units bring to the overall post-secondary institution. At the same time, the board and the presidents and senior leaderships also have a role they must play. Okay. Th th thank you, Corey. I appreciate that. Um, I wanted to um, give Chief Cadmus Delorum a chance to uh, weigh in on that. You know, the, the, the role of um, truth and reconciliation and how do you how do you encourage students, as well as Corey pointed out, faculty and everybody involved to take ownership and be a part of reconciliation? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my wife and I raise a five-year-old daughter. Her, her name is Callie. And um, Callie, um, about four months ago, I was outside with my daughter and there was this plane in the sky and she's like, dad, what's that? And I said, that's a plane, my girl. And She's like, can I drive one of those? She said, yeah, absolutely. You want to be a pilot? I told her, you'll be a pilot when you get older. And, you know, next day I was driving to my meeting. I'm like, oh, my little girl wants to be a pilot. You know, and then the truth landed in my mind after that. My little girl is an Indigenous female in a country where it's the toughest person to be in this country is an Indigenous female. And so my wife and I have to put in extra work in this country just to make sure our daughter becomes a pilot. Why, why in a country called Canada does my wife and I have to do that? That's the reality 
of why truth and reconciliation is so important. Don't do it for your 20 friends on your social media that might be Indigenous. Don't do it for the five or six Indigenous people in your faculty or company. Do it for the fact that your five-year-old daughter, granddaughter, or niece wants to be just like my five-year-old daughter. Doesn't matter what race you are in this country. Everybody should be dreamers in a country we call Canada, one of the best in this country. We truly inherited this. Who are the authors of the Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action? The over 100,000 residential school survivors who told their story, two of them being my parents. So they can't go back and be five-year-old again, but my five-year-old daughter has a chance. So take the Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action, implement them into your personal lives, your, your uh, social lives, your, your business lives, and even into the political lives. When MPs, MLAs, mayors, council come to your door, that should be a standard question today. What are you doing to help with truth and reconciliation calls to action? I guarantee you, if we take this that serious, in one generation, we can truly make this country one of the greatest. And that's why it's so important. Okay, thank you. I we have one more question before we go to audience um, questions. Um, and there was, there's one that's, that's sort of similar to uh, one of the questions. So our, our last question for the panel was, um, the, the formalized was, who should be doing the educating, telling the stories that need to be shared? Now, this other a question I added to it is, if you're not Indigenous, would it be, a, be appropriate to include materials in a course in post-secondary schools? And this person's um, thinking of using a case study about a ninja small business in Canada. So um, <laughs> I leave that one open to whoever wants to take it. Well, I'll, I'll just say, yeah. I'm sure uh, Dr. Bear has a lot to say as well, but I just say the reality is, is that as teachers, as academics, we teach about stuff that we don't have first knowledge of anyways. If you're an English teacher and you're teaching about Shakespeare, you weren't alive in the time of Shakespeare. So you're okay to teach other people's knowledge and stories. And I recognize the sensitivity of teaching of Indigenous culture and stories, um, and you don't want to offend. But the reality is, is you've got to do the work. You've got to, we have to have others. Tracy and I and Cadmus cannot do all of the teaching to all of the people in Canada that need this. So we need allies to do this teaching, but you have to ensure that you know the case study appropriately. It's okay to start off and say, you know, I'm not Indigenous, but here's what I've learned. And I've talked to Dr. Tracy Bear about it, or I've talked to the elder about it. And if anybody has anything to add, or if I misspeak, please let me know. So we need people to do that. You do it in other areas of your of the academy of the of the you know the breadth and depths of, of faculty um so we've got to do this you've got to overcome that fear as as dr bear said earlier and, and cadmus said as well how hard do you if you're afraid to do it how hard do you think it has been for us as indigenous people to attend these institutions not even residential school but to attend public school and to attend universities as the only indigenous person in the class you've got to put your fear in context and you've got to seek out how to get that get further support to ensure that you are being respectful and and recognize that you will make a mistake and if you make a mistake you apologize i am so sorry tell me what i can do better next time but we have to go forth with courage and make sure that we do this because you know as Kadam has said in one generation we could make change if all of us contribute to this uh process thank you obviously um corey has um flipped it over to you to, to tracy to have to give us some feedback on it what beautifully said Corey. um yeah. I, there's a, just a i absolutely agree and a couple of things i would add to that is you know we're talking stories are funny things we're talking sometimes there's sacred stories uh and there's stories that you know for cree people we only tell in the winter time um and those aren't the stories that we're talking about now the stories that we're talking about now is like histories and and um etc 
Uh, so just like any good academic, when you're writing a paper, you're citing everyone, right? You're telling where your sources came from. It's the same thing in telling, um, talking about Indigenous histories and Indigenous peoples. Where's that teaching from? Give those people that credit, that knowledge keeper. When I have stories and I tell teachings, this is who I got it from. This is where I learned this. And so giving the proper, um, uh, I can't think of another word, proper credit uh, for people is really important and coming to that with so much grace and, and humility that really, you know, I say this a lot in academics, you won't find an academic saying this very often, you know, I know nothing. I know nothing, and when I'm 98, I will still know nothing, you know, and so there's a humility that has to come uh, with that as well. So uh, I encourage everyone to um, also speak about your positionality. Allies can talk about these things, and, and Corey said that the best, like, we need these allies. We can't do it all ourselves, but make sure you position yourselves as such. Don't go out saying, I'm the end-all be-all of all Cree knowledge. You're not. Nobody is. And so that's an, always important to remember is to position yourself um, honestly uh, with integrity and uh, humility. Thank you. Those are great answers. Um, and, and I agree, agree with both of you in that position. That's my position as well. But we have to be honest. Um, there is a fear up there of doing the wrong thing, saying the wrong thing. And um, it's very realistic. I was at an event one time where a very clearly non-Indigenous lady, and she said that, tried to incorporate some Indigenous knowledges into her class. Um, and it was mostly an Indigenous audience. And she got verbally you know, stripped down in, in that meeting from the ed educators in the room and so much that she broke down crying. I went and talked to her after and talked to her about it. But there was, in my mind, there was two things that were wrong there. One, she didn't do enough research to understand. And two, the, the people in the room weren't, and this was 10 years ago, weren't maybe ready to have a non-Indigenous people person take a lead role in talking about education and the truth of our histories. Um, so I'd ask, um, if um, Chief Cadmus would like to comment on that role and how we move forward from there. Well, thank you very much. Uh, in my first university class, when I um, went in very uh, reserve biased, I grew up on my reserve and uh, just want to say when you live on a First Nation, especially in the prairies, when the cities are more than an hour and a half away, your life on the reserve is 10 kilometers an hour and it's lovely. When you get to the city, it's a hundred kilometers an hour. So it's like you either sink or swim. So I'd usually uh, enjoy being on, on my first nation. When I got to university, I, I didn't really know too much of my history, even though I grew up on Calvary's, but I just want to give you a picture of, of the question here. And I'm going to be quick because I know our time is limited. That's um, Professor Segu walks into this class of a hundred people. Professor Segu is is black. And I'm like, I'm an Indigenous studies class. And my first thing was, why do all these non-Indigenous people want to learn about Indigenous people? And I'm like, my professor ain't even Indigenous. By the third class, she debated in such manner. I was her biggest cheerleader in there. I was like, you tell them, Professor Segu. Then one day she's like, let's hear what Cadmus has to say. And I was so nervous because I didn't public speak at the time. And I, and I just um, gave them the truth. And so where I'm going with this is there's a literal approach, and that is the truth. People don't have to be caramel-colored skin to, to teach the literal side. But when it comes to the spirit side, the spirit and intent, please, please make sure you reach out to your local Indigenous nations, because that is a very, very sacred part of our history that needs to be taught. So literal Please do it correctly. I, I need allies out there to do it, but the spirit and intent, please reach out to your local Indigenous nations. All right, thank you very much. And I, I really appreciate your comments. And um, I, I wanna make sure that our, I would like to take more questions because there's some good questions, but we, we really don't have time. And I wanna give our panelists uh, at least a couple of minutes to give us some final thoughts. And we'll start with um, Tracy, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, and speaking of um, citing people, I did say a friend of mine um, talked about the Indigenous allyship and his name is Dakota Swiftwolf. 
uh, he did the uh, indigenous corporate training and um, I, I love his approach in, in allyship and co-resistorship as well. Um, closing remarks. Uh, so I love Martin Luther King and, um, and the man had um, an incredible sense of spirit and community that I think is reflected in many of our indigenous teachings. And he tells us, quote, that in the end, it's not the hateful words of our enemies that hurt. It's the silence of our friends. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter, end quote. So educate yourself. Get a grip on the colonial history of Canada and Indigenous peoples. Uh, education is an ongoing process. Uh, change is never easy. And that uncomfortability, remember, that's where the learning starts and great things can happen. You'll never be an expert on Indigenous challenges and what it feels like to be a Nehio Esqueo, a Cree woman in Canada, but you can work on yourself and you can work on allyship and co-resistorship. Aye, aye. Can I ask man? Big witch. Corey, would you like to take a couple minutes now? Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, and thank you for all of the comments that have gone ahead uh, ahead of me. And just to add to what uh, Dr. Bear said as well, is that the reality, diversity is a reality. Inclusion is a choice. We have to decide. We're here, obviously, as Indigenous people, we are still here, even though policies were orchestrated to ensure that we would no longer be here, to kill the Indian in child, to be absorbed into the body politic. That was what was said about us. But we are here. We are strong. We are proud. We are recovering, of course, in some ways, we know that we are at the negative end of every social economic indicator that must change. And that will require all of us as Canadians to ensure that that changes. So every single one of us has a role to ensure that this change happens. I believe that when people know better, they do better. Certainly finding that knowledge sometimes and, and getting those teachings can be challenging. But just as, as Dr. Bear said, it's not just about knowing it. Once you know it, you must do something about it it so once you know once you know better you must do better it's not enough to sit by and just watch this continuously happen what can you do in all of the places and spaces that you occupy in your work life your personal life your family life what can you do in all of those places and spaces to make a difference if you walk into a room and everyone looks like you well, you need to figure, or sorry, if everyone, yeah, if everyone looks like you, you need to figure out why. Why is that? Why aren't there Indigenous people in the room? We haven't achieved parity yet for women in Canada. So we have a lot of work to do here. And it's not just about listening and it's not just about learning. But once you do learn, you have to go to that next step. It's about honoring, it's about elevating, and it's about incorporating. And it's about doing, as, as uh, Chief DeLorme said, doing that hard work. It's about doing that really challenging work. You have to be uncomfortable and we have to focus on systemic change, not just tokenism, placate all of that we have to really break down and break through the post-colonial door thank you and Cadmus chief thank you Corey uh thank you chief uh thank you uh Dr Bear it, it's about relationship this country is going to be the greatest in the world and in, in the coming generation I I feel that but the thing is is what is it about relationship internally this charter of rights and freedoms that drives us all is about vertical lineage. It's about mom passing knowledge to daughter, daughter passing knowledge to granddaughter. And we have to strengthen that. We have to invest in that. Our youth are so disconnected with our adults and elders today and indigenous and not. All we need to do is search within indigenous ideologies to strengthen all families in this country. That vertical lineage is really important to keeping our country as, as truly Canadian as possible. We have to stop trying to think that the Western ideology is the solution. The moment that we welcome in Indigenous knowledge, I guarantee you this country is going to, it's going to be set in many different ways, social. And uh, I, I truly believe that the Indigenous people are awake. We, we are ready. And then the question is, is Canada ready for the amount of knowledge we're about to, to share with Canada to make this country uh, the greatest in the world? And I think it's forums like this that allow us to, to drop those truths, 
put our shield down and be able to speak honestly and to take it in a way that let's implement it somewhere. So thank you very much for letting me share. Thank you. Well, you know, I really appreciated um, the the um, three panelists. You you must be my favorite academic people I've um, listened to in a long time um, because the the truth that you give is 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 what you've learned, but it's also part of who you are, and that makes it such a more interesting conversation because sometimes academia focuses solely on the on the uh, the study of um, certain specific things and and not always does it come from the heart as well as the mind so i really appreciate the panelists i, I thank the empire you know the empire club for um, hosting and um, the viewers for coming in and i hope that um, the viewers demand that these um, speakers come back again and talk again because i think they have a lot more value to add to this conversation uh, you can invite me back if you want that doesn't matter <laughs> but i would i'd like to say that um you know, I once wrote a poem, and I won't read it because we don't have time, called Common Ground. And when I read that poem, I read it from the perspective of the Indigenous people when I wrote it. But when I read it out loud at certain settings, I realized it was a part of everybody, that everybody in the audience heard or saw themselves at least a little bit in that poem. And so that taught us that we're never so far apart that we can't find common ground. And I think that's very important to moving towards reconciliation. The other thing I would like to say by ending this is, um, um, you know, it's it's not enough anymore to just provide education. We have to raise consciousness. And, and I think that's what this panel does. And so Chima Gwichen, thank you. And I'd like to um, pass it back to Kelly. Kelly. Thank you. And thank you so much to our panelists, our guests today for a very, enlightening conversation uh, with so many, I think, really important items for us to take away, reflect, think about, and, and act. Um, I think that's the other key piece, right? The education piece is critical, but action is also where we need to head. And I also just want to say that I'll probably be uh, quoting uh, Dr. Bear <laughs> talking about citing people, um, specifically wrote down, um, an educated ally is a sign of privilege. And that is something that is, for me, just deeply resonating out of this conversation. I'd now like to take this opportunity to welcome Monica James. Monica is the Regional Manager for Client Diversity and Chair of the Indigenous Peoples, ERG, which is an employee resource group at BBC, the Business Development Bank of Canada. Monica is going to deliver some appreciation remarks. Monica, welcome. Thank you, Kelly. Wow, what a powerful, truthful, and insightful conversation. It might have been hard for some of us to hear. One thing we have to remember is that as Canadians, we must have the courage to have bold conversations. We also have an obligation that we need to tell the truth. And what's so critical and so important, which Chief Cadmus shared today, is that we need to let Indigenous people heal at their own pace. Growing up, I didn't get to learn about my Indigenous history and culture because my mother wasn't allowed to talk about it. Today, I'm a proud Cree woman from the Peter Ballantyne Cree Nation, and I'm a guest on Treaty One lands in the homelands of the Métis Nation. Miigwech to Ogama Laforme, Dr. Tracy Baer, Chief Delorme, and Corey Wilson. I want to thank you for your time, for your wisdom, and for the beautiful teachings that you shared with us today. For Indigenous people, we get asked all the time to speak and to provide our viewpoints. And what, what non-Indigenous people really need to learn is it causes us deep pain. So I want to make sure that you take the time that you need to heal from today. And everybody in the audience, we also have to make sure that we need to honour all these amazing knowledge keepers and the information that they share with us today. I want to thank the Empire Club. This is your second Indigenous event in less than a year. Big kudos to you. This is a healthy example of reconciliation. We need to remember that it's a journey and it's not meant to happen overnight or by hosting a few events. And last but not least, I wanna thank everybody who showed up today. You know what? You could have made other lunch plans, but you know what? You chose to be here and thank you for that. Thank you for listening with an open heart and empathetic ears. 
We have to remember that what was shared with you today isn't meant for you to keep and to hold for yourself. It's meant to be shared. Reconciliation starts when non-Indigenous people use their voice to educate others and stand up for those that have been silenced. The decisions that you make today from what you heard will impact others and the organization for many years to come. So let's remember that reconciliation is about giving Indigenous people, culture and history, the time and space we deserve to be heard and to be understood. So let's make sure that today's teachings aren't lost and that they live on for many generations to come. Miigwech. Thank you, Monica. And thanks again to BDC and all our sponsors for their support. And thank you to our guests, everybody who joined us today or who will watch later on demand. This event is on January 28th at 12 noon Eastern time. Join us as we hear from the Honorable Todd Smith, Ontario's Minister of Energy. Minister Smith will be talking to us about the province's clean energy advantage and its role in generating economic growth. More details and complimentary registration are available at empireclubofcanada.com. This meeting is now adjourned. I wish you a great afternoon. Take care and stay safe.